<clears throat> All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me properly. Um, this session has to take place a little bit on the go. And um, I apologize for any inconveniences in terms of uh, audio quality, etc. Um, I am on the move, I'm in a conference, so I have uh, Michael Levin's talk and discussion uh, just to let you know about the overall logistics of the event and to, well, welcome all of you online, of course. Um, so what I wanted to say very, very briefly, because uh, we don't have a lot of time, is that uh, as many of you already know values, etc. So uh, I'm sure Alvaro uh, can uh, post some links where um, you can see all these things. Um, and I would just want to play a uh, trailer that we have on our channel. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen it, uh, but I think it would be a good summary to just uh, fill in in a, in a couple of minutes uh, what SEMP is about. So I'm going to just share my screen for that. So let's actually do this. It. Now share it so everyone can see it. Although it's going to YouTube as well. Um, yep. I have to share with audio probably. Yep. So, yeah, this is a quick summary of what SAMP is about. Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research, SEMF, from its original Spanish acronym, is created in response to the current scientific, social and technological environment. Despite the fast communications and interconnectivity of the information age, most branches of knowledge are still largely segregated, and institutions dedicated to their advancement tend to be managerially complex, often constrained by their history and rarely in substantial cooperation with each other. This contrasts with recent developments, showing that today's frontiers of human understanding often lie outside the bounds of traditional disciplines. SEMF aims to address fundamental questions with rigour and honesty, always striving to consider them broadly, profoundly and contextually. We believe that this type of intellectual endeavour is most likely to flourish in dynamic environments that foster the creative exploration of ideas and the organic growth of research projects and collaborations. SEMP aspires to provide such an environment by keeping things simple, staying managerially lightweight and being run by a team of active researchers and intellectuals. At SEMP, we promote rationality and scientific thinking across all human inquiry, since we consider these to be the best tools for development of civilization and the understanding of the universe we all inhabit. Our universalist approach to human knowledge helps us bridge the gap between traditionally disjointed disciplines particularly the familiar yet limiting divide between the sciences and humanities. This mindset allows us to identify deep themes across diverse topics, a powerful asset when trying to unify separate areas of research. Ultimately, SEMF aims to establish a pluralistic community of scientists, creatives, academics, artists, students, intellectuals, and generally enthusiasts united under the common goal of delving deeper into fundamental questions. In principle, all topics are welcome under the SEMF dome. However, given its fundamental nature, subjects such as linguistics, physics, cognitive science, mathematics, complexity science, philosophy, biology, or computer science are well represented in our events and activities. 
To accomplish our goals, we currently do three things. We ideate and organise transdisciplinary conferences and seminars. We host the St. Queer podcast, where small groups of experts with different backgrounds come together to discuss a transversal topic. And we maintain the Agora, a platform implemented on Discord and Telegram, where our members can self-organise and participate in talks, debates, study groups and social gatherings. All the information about SEMF can be found on our website, www.semf.org.es. There you can also become a member in a couple of clicks. In our YouTube channel, you can find our live streams and podcast recordings. And follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with all our events and announcements and find us on most other social media platforms. Okay, so that was, all right, so that was the trailer. So of course, I should thank uh, this dispenser who's here in the call. She's gonna be taking uh, part of the summer school and she's been a supporter and early supporter of the SEM project. Um, so uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that we, uh, we're we running everything on Discord. So just to get it out of the way, so I'm, I'm sure that I have enough time to address this. Uh, we're gonna be, um, Communicating over Discord, we're going to be discussing and interacting over Discord um, almost exclusively. So we will send important emails about, you know, links that are, you know, recurrent and uh, other 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 kinds of information that are sort of in, important enough. But for the vast majority of interactions, we're going to be located on on Discord. So to uh, do it, um, we. As I say, uh, I'm going to coordinate things over there. Uh, there's a very uh, nice functionality to have a local uh, time uh, display. So you can actually create sort of uh, timestamps with uh, sort of universal time. So each user will see their local time zone. So we're going to coordinate most, ev most events in this way. Uh, all activities, uh, both official and, and uh, sort of central and uh, sort of self-organized by, by participants will be made into events that you can check in the event tab of the server. So, so that's a sort of handy tool to sort of unify and, and funnel all, all the, all the uh, logistics uh, of the school. So we don't have a, a lot of time right now, but uh, just uh, to really emphasize that if you, if you are connected to, to Discord, uh, you will you will be uh, in the know of everything. There's, there's really no nothing to to miss over there. Um, if uh, perhaps there's uh, is there anything that you would like to mention, Alvaro or Danny, about the Discord in particular or the sort of logistics running? Because we do have five minutes uh, before uh, sort of we go on with the next session. Um, uh, just to address quickly, Alvaro, you said that the live stream is might be lagging a little bit. So it probably is just a matter of. Uh, the connection here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record locally the Zoom uh, meeting as well when when Michael uh, comes in, just just to be sure, be sure that we have the source file. Um, and something that I also have to do probably is uh... okay. Yeah. So now that's changed. Um, so I'm going to take these five minutes just to. Um, and sort of take a look at ourselves. So take a look at the participants who are here in the meeting and the people who are taking place in the summer school. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen to, uh, where do I want to go? Yes, I want to go here. Um, so this is also an, a reminder for everyone to um, go uh, to the website and to have a look at the website. We have been uh, working on this for some time now. And although we, we don't have uh, sort of professional standards of uh, web development yet, uh, I think we are uh, quite happy with the, with the final result uh, of the website. So I should probably refresh website. OK, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so let's take a look at the summer school overall. Uh, so here we have a, OK, this is a bit um, Let's see how I do it, how I fit this. Um, okay, so I think you can more or less see, I, I'm, I'm on the laptop and you, you, you will be able to see this properly when you when you go on, but we've sort of uh, tried to uh, illustrate the interdisciplinarity of the contributions by having this kind of Venn diagram of, um, of contributions. Uh, I 
encourage you to, to explore it on at your own leisure. Uh, we have here the list of all the speakers. I'm sure many of you have, have seen it already. Um, some quick descriptions of, of activities that will be happening in person for those of you who are coming to Valencia next week. Um, the schedule that we will be updating probably soon as well with the final uh, times. These are sort of still tentative times. Um, and the one that I wanted to sort of emphasize for everyone here now live is the participant data, because I think this gives a, a nice um, sort of uh, uh, cross-section of uh, people gathered in, in this meeting, right? So, so we have a lot of people uh, uh, registered in total. So we're quite happy to see uh, quite, a, you know, quite an international crowd uh, coming together to um, listen to interesting talks, to join discussions, and to network with, with other uh, people, uh, with other attendees. Um, you can see they're sort of um, interested in, in what Sam is doing. So I wanted to spend some time uh, showing uh, this data visualizations that we expect that uh, we want to communicate with the with the summer school is your game. Hopefully, things you will learn, the people you will meet, the thoughts you. But it, the but the society's principles and the society's aspirations. So these data visualizations are intended to uh, somehow uh, hammer down this uh, these ideas, right? Um, so what we do is when we when you register, everyone here will remember that uh, we ask you a question. Uh, that is, what disciplines better represent your research activity or interests? Um, and so, sorry, next week we'll have uh, courses for you to understand these this words. Uh, but basically, that's just represents a set of, of, um, of the options uh, chosen. Uh, and so, each participant is uh, represented by a shape that will join, sort of graphically join, uh, the number of, um, uh, the number of uh, choices, the number of options that they've, they've chosen. So, um, some of some of the data analysis of this of that data set that's the whole data set and some of the data analysis is to see uh, for example the inter interdisciplinary depth so the number of uh, chosen disciplines uh, by participants right so we see that there's a fair amount of participants that just identify themselves with one um, uh, a little over 20 just uh, with one discipline uh, but we have a big bulk of uh, participants that identify with two three four and five uh, disciplines. And of course, uh, we have a sort of a natural tail into the higher order interdisciplinarity. And then, of course, we have a little bump in the I'm interested in everything, which is, of course, a category, category of its own. Um, so we're quite happy with this with this profile. We're also very happy with the representation profile. So we, although it's obvious that by the nature of the particular courses that we offer and particular talks that we offer this year, we're going to have a concentration in computation, mathematics, uh, philosophy, cognition, etc. Um, we still have a, a sizable representation of arts, education, linguistics. So you can see that uh, about the lowest representation, which might be linguistics or anthropology, is not is not below the a fourth of what computation is. So I think that's a healthy a healthy count. And then we we just uh, break this down a bit more uh, to see some sort of higher order uh, distribution of the information. This this is a, a way to visualize which uh, disciplines end up. Uh, pairing or grouping rather with uh, with other. I mean, pairing will just be column number two, but this is uh, you know the groupings of, of all of all orders of all sizes, and so you can see which uh, disciplines uh, are more likely in this event to be uh, grouped with others, right? So we can see that naturally mathematics and, and physics tend to be or philosophy tend to be quite central in the sense um, in the in the in the event. Now, of course, um, one way to, to parse this uh, large amount of information is to simply go down to the binary level and say, okay, where, where are the pairs of, um, of disciplines that happen more often? And you can see that simply by sort of uh, exploring this, uh, this widget here, uh, which is basically taking the hypergraph, so the entire data source, and, uh, and reducing it to the, to the pairwise uh, data. And similarly with the ternary data. So this, this uh, diagram here misses entirely uh, uh, just a single pair mentions and goes uh, only to higher order that reduces to three. And the fact that this is basically just a blurred uh, diagram represents that indeed there's quite a lot of overlap and we have quite a lot of uh, combination of disciplines. So of course we knew this because this this uh, diagram, this profile was quite or relatively flat, uh, but also this being quite homogeneous means that we are um, we have uh, quite a lot of mix of of such, uh, of such uh, disciplines. Okay, so I think that's about it when it comes to what I wanted to um, present and uh, sort of give a context for 
um, for the summer school and for the participants over here. So I see uh, Michael's already with us. Um, I just uh, stop sharing my screen. So um, maybe without further ado, we can uh, move on to the to the session. Uh, I don't know if Alvaro, Dani, uh, there was anything you wanted to know, or if anyone has a quick question about the logistics, about any of the sort of organizational aspects of the summer school. Um, feel free to to uh, unmute yourself and ask now. I see a few messages on the on the chat, but I think this is uh, mostly uh, organizational. So I'll I'll give you about twenty seconds in case someone wants to ask something. Otherwise we can just um, move on to the first session. <clears throat> okay, so that seems to be that no one, no one is uh, Asking any questions, so I'm, I'm happy that that was clear enough. Hopefully, that's that's the reason. Um, and yes, so I'm very glad to uh, introduce uh, Michael Levin. Uh, he is the Vannevar Bush Professor in the Biology Department at Tufts University, and uh, he leads uh, the Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology. He has a dual background, both in biology and computer science, and his research in uh, bioelectrical communication, uh, shaping organisms, morphology. And his theories uh, uh, on how spatial and temporal information um, are communicated in the process of uh, biological self-assembly uh, have been groundbreaking and have been one of the main focuses of uh, some of our uh, internal uh, seminars and working groups. So we are delighted to have Michael Levin with us again. Uh, he was uh, about a year ago uh, presenting a, a talk at the Spatial Speciality uh, Conference that we hosted online. Uh, this year, uh, we, we are not yet in person in Valencia, but next week we will have uh, a nice uh, gathering in, in Valencia. And uh, so Michael wasn't able to make it live then, so he was uh, kind enough to, to move the day to uh, fitting first day of the, of the preschool week. So uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to all of you. Um, an amazing uh, interdisciplinary group here, and I'm going to uh, share some ideas. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. Uh, can everybody see the slides? Cool. So, okay. So, so, so my understanding is that, uh, I do about an hour talk and then take some questions. Uh, if uh, you want something different, please stop me or, or let me know. So, uh, today what we will talk about are a number of, uh, questions across, uh, computer science, biology, uh, and some philosophy. And if anybody is interested in, uh, chasing down more, um, details afterwards, everything can be found here, all the papers, uh, the code, uh, everything else, everything else is here. And, and of course, you can also you can also contact me here. So the main point that I would like to get across today is this, I'm going to talk about uh, my framework, which I call TAME stands for technological approach to mind everywhere. And uh, the most important part of this thing is that the, I, I will argue that the, the philosophy actually matters. It drives new discoveries. I'm going to show you uh, some things that we've done that are uh, directly emerging from a, a, sp a specific way we think about these things that otherwise was, was not found. I'm going to talk about um, goal directedness. Recording uh, in progress. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm going to talk about goal directedness as a kind of invariant for recognizing, building, and uh, communicating, or in some cases, controlling agents in unconventional embodiments. And specifically, we'll talk about this uh, cognitive boundary model and some other things you know, like polycomputing. I'm gonna use uh, heavily uh, the example of anatomical control as the kind of con collective intelligence that navigates a problem space. That problem space is anatomical morphous space. And I'm going to talk about how electrical networks are uh, the kind of uh, ancient evolutionary medium, uh, an ancestor of what happens in the brain that uh, allows, uh, to, that, that functions as a kind of cognitive glue to bind individual cells to uh, intelligent collective behavior. And this has many implications for biomedicine and so on. And, so, and at the end, we'll talk about synthetic bioengineering and the uh, huge option space of new bodies and new minds. And so we'll, we'll talk about that, okay. So uh, the first thing that I want to talk about are just some, some, some basic uh, fundamentals. Um, so this is a picture that uh, is very old. This is a classic uh, painting. Uh, Adam is naming the animals in the Garden of Eden. And uh, although this is kind of a pre-scientific worldview, I think in many ways it still shapes 
a lot of discussion both in, in science and philosophy because it really emphasizes this idea of discrete natural kinds. So, so here is, uh, here is the, 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 the human and people often talk about, let's say in the context of artificial intelligence or whatever, they, they talk about the human mind. And so what they mean both on the uh, evolutionary timescale and the developmental timescale that actually there are no discrete natural kinds here in the sense that all of this is a very smooth, gradual continuum. So, so, so we, we, we stand uh, uh, as, at one particular point of a very long set of uh, very smooth, gradual changes that uh, eventually make, uh, make significant alterations to our capabilities. But it's, it's really, you have, to, you have to understand the whole continuum to, to understand what what this thing is capable of, and this sort of this this magical agential glow where people say, well, humans are do this, and then machines or animals do something else, it it becomes very clear that you can't just draw a nice boundary about a, a crisp boundary around a modern human. You have to understand where do these things come from, um, and in fact, it's it's even it's even worse than that because not only are we part of the this natural continuum, but there's actually now we see that we are part of a an engineering continuum, both in terms of biological changes and in terms of uh, technological hybridization, where at every level of the organism, we can mix in uh, different components. Some of them are evolved, some of them are engineered. Uh, and and uh, so, so again, there's this gradual slow uh, set of changes to where, where uh, one um, might ask, where do these various um, properties begin and end and how do they change? So my framework, uh, really is is focused on the on, on this goal of being able to simultaneously to, together consider very unconventional agents. So I want to think about all possible beings. So this is familiar creatures like us, birds, uh, apes, you know, octopus, things like that. But also very strange creatures like colonial organisms and swarms and engineered synthetic biology that might be made, artificial intelligence, whether in software or hardware, uh, and possible exobiological agents. We should be able to think about all of these things using the same tools. And that uh, forces us to ask, what do they all have in common? If it isn't origin story, and it isn't uh, the material from which they are made, then the question is, what, what do they all have in common? And uh, of course, I'm not the first person to try for something like this. Here's a Wiener and colleagues um, scale that goes all the way from, from passive matter all the way up to uh, kind of human level, second order metacognition and so on. And so, and so my framework needs to be able to uh, say something about this. What do they all have in common? And to move experimental work forward. This is critical. We, we, I'm not interested in uh, just um, a conceptual uh, philosophy. I'm interested in things that interface with the real world and, and drive new discoveries. And so uh, kind of a central uh, component of this is the idea that the kinds of systems that we're interested in exist on a, a spectrum, and it's a spectrum of persuadability. What that means is that there is an observer, uh, and it might be the system itself, it, but it doesn't have to be an external observer. It's, it's systems are also observers of themselves and their own parts. But there's an external observer that must ask the question, what is the most efficient way to interface, functionally interface with that system. So for example, for certain systems like, like mechanical clocks, um, you're not going to convince them of anything. You're not going to reward or punish them. The only thing you can do is modify them via hardware and, uh, or hack them in that, in that simple sense. Uh, there are other systems that are uh, so these kind of cybernetic homeostatic systems where you might be able to take advantage of the fact that uh, they pursue simple kinds of goals and you might rewrite uh, or edit some of those goals and let the system take care of the rest. And then more complex according with the experiences that it's had. So you rely on its learning interface. And then of course, uh, at some level you get to systems that are able to uh, pursue uh, reasons, not just causes. And there you, you can uh, interact with this system in a very different way. And of course, everything in between, these are just four, four way, waypoints. There are many more waypoints. But the idea, the, 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 the point here is that we cannot uh, assume where things stand. You cannot sit back in, in a sort of philosophical armchair and say, well, this is just a machine or it's just a piece of physics or whatever. And therefore I know it has to be down here. You actually don't know that. Um, you have to do experiments and you have to try these various uh, stances and see what affords it. So it's an empirical question, which affords the most, uh, the richest and the, and the best interaction, you know, hardware modification or uh, maybe even something like this. So uh, the, the key to um, is starting to think like this is, is to realize that all of us uh, journeyed across this, uh, what, what used to be called the Cartesian cut, this idea that 
Uh, we all start life as a single cell. It's a quiescent oocyte and people look at it and say, well, this is a little blob of chemistry and physics. It is not cognitive. It is, it does not have uh, what, what are, you know, you, you name it, uh, whatever you're interested in. Uh, just, it's just, uh, just chemistry and physics, but slowly and gradually we become one of these things, or maybe even something like this, a, 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 a deeply thinking um, a human that's going to make claims about being more than a machine and so on. And so the thing about uh, developmental biology, I think it's it's the most magical of all sciences because there you literally see in front of your eyes at a desk, at a bench top, if you look at, for example, a frog embryo, you literally see the journey from, from physics and chemistry to a scale up of mind. And um, and, and, and these steps, and, and, and the key is that developmental biology offers no special a moment at which some sort of lightning flash gives you a uh, true cognition, whereas before you just had chemistry and physics, that, that there's, no, there's no such point. So it's just a slow, slow uh, uh, transformational process. But we can think at least we're a unified intelligence, right? We all feel ourselves as, as one unified being, and, and we don't think we're the same as, let's say, a colony of ants, which is a, like a traditional um, collective intelligence. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, we, we, we're, we're, a, we're, we're not a collective intelligence, right? We're, we're, we're unified in some sense. Um, in fact, in fact, Descartes was really into the uh, pineal gland because there was only one of them. That pineal gland is this. This is what it looks like. There are many, many cells. And inside each of those cells, there's all of this stuff. So uh, just, just a tremendous, and this isn't even, this is by no means all. So we are, uh, we are uh, very much a, uh, a collective. Um, in fact, um, I think all intelligences are collective intelligences in the sense that they're made of parts. And we really need to understand how this, uh, how this scale up um, happens. Uh, this is this is the kind of thing we're made of. This is a single cell. So this is a free. This happens to be a free living organism known as a lacrimaria. You can see what it's doing. It's 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 uh, hunting and it's uh, for food in its environment. It has huge competencies for single cell level agendas. So it uh, handles its physiology, its um, anatomical needs, its uh, metabolic needs, and so on, all at the scale of one cell. There is no brain. There's no nervous system. Uh, this is the agential material out of which we are all made. And individual cells have lots of competencies. And we need to start thinking about this because we're used to, we're used to thinking about uh, coarse grained higher level beings. For example, here's a rat. The rat presses a lever, learns to get the reward, and now the rat uh, owns the associative memory between pressing the lever and getting the reward. But in fact, there are no individual cells in this creature that had both experiences. There were cells at the bottom of the, of the uh, foot that interacted with the lever. There are cells in the gut that uh, reap the, uh, the, the, the sugar of the reward, but no individual cell has both experiences. So who is it that actually owns the association? Who, what, what can make the association between these two experiences? And what is this, this rat that we say? Uh, it, it, it requires, this whole, this whole process requires a kind of cognitive glue. It requires a way to uh, synthesize from the experiences of individual cells to something much larger that can have goals and preferences and um, competencies, memories, agendas, and so on that no individual cell has. And so we need to understand that. Uh, and, and this is now, now this seems very common. This, this happens all the time. So we're kind of used to this, but there are some, some very interesting cases that tell us that uh, the story is actually quite, quite more, uh, much more complex. So this is, this is a caterpillar. And it lives in a two-dimensional world of crawling on flat surfaces. It has a certain kind of brain appropriate with it. It eats leaves. This caterpillar uh, is a soft-bodied uh, kind of uh, construction. It needs to uh, turn into something quite different, which is this hard-bodied machine that flies around and it drinks nectar. And it has all sorts of different behaviors. It lives in a three-dimensional world. In order to get from here to here, this creature basically deconstructs its brain. This brain is taken apart. Most of the cells are killed off. The connections are broken. It, it uh, creates a new brain that's suitable for driving this kind of body. Uh, something very, very critical here is that it's been found that, um, you can read about it here. This is all the work of Doug Blackiston, that uh, caterpillars that are trained to associate um, uh, feeding with a, with a specific stimulus, that memory persists. So, so the butterfly still remember and can be can be tested behaviorally to, to show that they can still remember. So, so, so here are a few a few remarkable things. First, uh, that memory survives basically the deconstruction of the brain. We don't have any computer architectures that work like that. So, how how does the memory even survive? So that's that's the first thing. Is I, I don't think we understand very much about um, how memory is stored at all. The second interesting thing is that the memory is uh, generalized and transformed because. 
uh, butterflies and caterpillars don't eat the same things. So butterflies drink nectar, caterpillars eat uh, leaves. So you cannot simply learn that that stimulus associates with the presence of leaves because that will not serve the butterfly at all. That memory has to be uh, converted and generalized into the idea of food, not leaves, but the generic concept of food so that the butterfly can now do, uh, can make use of that memory and um, acquire, acquire food that's completely different from anything the, the caterpillar ever saw. And uh, what, what, what's happening here is that these memories are being remapped onto a new architecture, not just in the sense of driving a different body, but in the sense of having actually novel generalized meanings. And then finally, you know, you can ask yourself this, this philosophical question, you know, um, Thomas Nagel asked, uh, what's, what's it like to be a bat? Well, the second order question is, what's it like to be a caterpillar slowly changing into a butterfly? Not on an evolutionary timescale, but on the timescale of a single organism. What is this? Uh, what is this um, transformation like? What's 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 the experience like? Um, there are even more radical uh, scenarios such as these with planaria, where these are flatworms. Uh, we'll hear much more about them later in the talk, but. These guys regenerate their heads. And so what you can do is you can train them uh, to recognize these little um, bumpy areas as where they get fed. So that's, uh, that's place conditioning basically. Um, and then you can cut off their heads. And, and so, so you, can re you can read about this. We did this in, uh, well, McConnell first did these kinds of things in the sixties. We um, repeated it with modern equipment in, uh, in 2013. Um, you can cut off their heads. The tail will sit there doing nothing. And then eventually it regenerates a new brain and the, the animal once again remembers the original training. So the memory is not strictly in the centralized uh, brain that they have. Uh, it's somewhere maybe throughout the body, but it also imprints that, that, that tail is able to imprint that information onto the new brain that appears. So the movement and the transformation of information through the bodies is what we're actually interested in. And of course, uh, there are many, many philosophical uh, kinds of questions like the malfunctioning transporter experiment where you, you make a copy of yourself of which one is you. In planaria, you can actually do that. You can cut them into pieces and all of them uh, have a good claim to being the original, um, the original animal. So, so this, this idea of, of moving and, uh, and converting information through tissues is something we're very interested in. Um, that plasticity is not only uh, for uh, these kind of invertebrates. Uh, here's, here's a kind of example. Uh, here's a tadpole. Um, you'll notice that um, there are no eyes where the eyes should be, but what we've done is we've induced an eye to form on the tail. So this animal uh, here, it for, these cells form, uh, form an eye on the tail. The, the thing makes an optic nerve. It synapses on the spinal cord here. It does not go all the way up to the brain. And these animals can see perfectly well out of that eye. We know because we've built this machine that tests them in behave, visual uh, behavioral uh, learning um, assays and they can see quite well. And so, uh, it doesn't take novel uh, and evolutionary adaptation. When you make a tadpole where the sensory motor architecture is completely wrong. So instead of the eyes connected to the brain, you've got this, this eye on its tail connected to the spinal cord, everything still works. You don't need multiple generations of adaptation to this. So what we're, what we're also very interested in is this kind of plasticity. Why does evolution make these kinds of flexible problem solving machines that can operate in novel um, configurations uh, and, and, and do these kinds of things that are not, um, not not standard. So the reason that uh, all of this uh, all of this works is that we are uh, we as biological beings are built on a multi-scale competency architecture. Not only structurally, you know, or uh, uh, swarms are made of animals, which is made of made of organs and so on, but uh, but functionally, each level uh, of uh, of bi biology is its own uh, kind of agent. It's, it has its own um, competencies to solve problems in specific spaces, um, and it is the it is the flexibility and the uh, goal directedness of these uh, different mechanisms at different levels in different spaces that allow for this kind of remarkable plasticity that uh, I just showed you some examples of, and we'll show you, but pretty good at noticing intelligence in three-dimensional space. So medium really uh, have a hard time uh, recognizing and you can have a primary perception of uh, the, the blood chemistry, your, your own blood chemistry. Um, and and uh, you could feel um, innately, you could feel all the things that were going on in your body physiology. I think you would have no trouble realizing that you live in this in this very high dimensional space and that your, uh, your liver, your kidneys are 
uh, navigational agents that are moving you through that the space a, a claim uh, for a, any kind of an intelligence claim for a system. We're basically taking an IQ test ourselves, and it's we, we as observers are saying we've identified uh, or, or failed to identify some problem intelligence that that system is to solve these problems. But that's that's us uh, taking an IQ test because we we are probably missing quite a bit. Um, we'll give you a couple of uh, very simple examples of these kind of unconventional problem solving capacities. So here's here's uh, here's a uh, an example with planaria. So 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 we take these flatworms um, and uh, we expose them to barium chloride. Barium blocks all potassium channels. It's a non-specific potassium channel blocker. As a result of which, their heads explode. The cells are very unhappy at not being able to transfer potassium. Their heads their heads explode. If you leave them in the barium, uh, a couple of weeks later, they grow a new head. And the new head is barium adapted. No problem. The new head has no problem with barium. So we asked, this is, this is really crazy. We asked, how is this possible? What's different about this new head that it can function in barium where this one cannot? And so what we did was uh, we looked at all the genes that were expressed here and all the genes that were expressed here. And of course, it doesn't have to be in the genes. It's just, it's, a, it's an easy technique that's available. And we simply asked, what's the difference? And the difference is only about, um, only about a dozen genes are different. So out of the space of uh, tens of thousands of possible genes, these cells identified exactly what they need to solve this physiological stressor. Now, the, the, the key point here is that planaria never see barium in the wild. There has never been an evolutionary selection pressure to know what to do when you encounter barium. This is a novel, this is an example of solving a novel problem. You're hit with a physiological stressor, the cells are dying, what do you do? It's a, I, I sort of visualize this as, as being in this um, nuclear reactor control room, the thing's melting down, there's a million buttons. What do you do? How do you know which, uh, which thing to press? because you don't have time to just randomly turn genes on and off. You don't have time for uh, selection the way you might in a bacterial colony. Um, <clears throat> you don't have time for gradient descent. How does the system know? So this is a kind of, uh, this is a kind of problem solving of navigating transcriptional space, meaning you can find that uh, in fact, they have uh, six different uh, six different types of learning where turning specific nodes on and off can give them memories that change the way they uh, act in the future, uh, including, uh, uh, for example, situation sensitization and so on. And so one thing that we think about a lot is this idea that evolution might actually be pivoting over time some of the same strategies, some of the same navigational policies for traversing these kind of spaces into novel spaces. So you keep the policy, you just change the sensors and effectors, and you can reuse the same uh, types of um, intelligence that, that you might have uh, for, for solving problems, and you can reuse them in novel spaces and, of course, grow them up. And so this goes all the way up through, for example, navigating linguistic space, where keeping a constant narrative through, uh, through, by t but through telling a story is actually a navigational task that's quite hard. Artificial intelligences today are, are quite limited in the, um, the, the, uh, how long they can maintain the, the train of a story. So, so all of these things, um, uh, all of these things uh, share some important properties. Okay. So, um, so that's, uh, that's the, the kind of the first part of the talk. Um, the next thing I want to do is uh, really talk about uh, a particular unconventional agent, uh, which is a cellular collective uh, of morphogenesis. It lives in an anatomical space um, and, of, and some other spaces as well. And we want to talk about um, bioelectricity as the informational medium that allows this to happen. So, um, yeah, this is Alan Turing. Alan uh, Turing was interested in intelligence, in uh, cognition, in unconventional embodiments of mind, in, in thinking, computation, machinery, and so on. And so he was interested in problem-solving machines through reprogrammability, a kind of plasticity. But um, weirdly, he also wrote this. Uh, he wrote this paper on the chemical basis of morphogenesis, which talked about uh, how... Uh, chemical order can come to be in embryonic development. Now, you might think that's kind of strange. Why would somebody who is interested in cognition and intelligence uh, outside of uh, the standard substrates, why would he be thinking about chemical basis of, of, of development? And I think that, uh, although I, I don't think he wrote anything about this, I, my, my gut feeling is that actually his genius saw the uh, deep and variant between these two areas, the building of the body and the building of a mind are actually uh, the same question. And um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that now. So uh, this is a cross section through a human torso. So look at all the 
in the, the incredible order, all the tissues, organ structures, everything is in the right place, the right shape next to each other. Um, wh where does this pattern come from? Wh where is this encoded? How, why, why are all, human, the, the, all normal humans have this invariant pattern? Well, you might be tempted to say, well, it's in the DNA, of course, we, we, we have a human genome, but we can read genomes now. And we know that uh, none of this kind of geometric information is directly in the genome. What the genome does specify is proteins, the micro level hardware that every cell gets to, gets to have. And so this, this, uh, this um, process come going from a set of embryonic blastomeres to building something exactly like this is, uh, is a very important uh, problem. Uh, how do the cells know what to make and when to stop? They have the hardware, but what does the software of life look like? Um, uh, if a piece of this is missing, how do we convince these cells to rebuild uh, and repair? And as engineers, and we'll talk about this um, even more at the end of the talk, um, what else is possible? Given a standard genome, what else, what else can you build with it? And uh, it's, it's important to, to understand that this is a very similar problem to understanding the structure of uh, ant and termite colonies, the structure of spider webs. The genomes of these animals don't specify these structures any more than the human genome specifies this structure. All of these are the products of, of various collective competencies of, of cells and tissues that are not directly specified in the, in the genome. So in order to understand this problem, uh, it's good to think about uh, uh, the end game of, of our field. What, uh, where, where are we going? What, what, what do we want to do? Um, and uh, to, to me, the, uh, the end game of this, meaning that uh, here, here's where we can say that we've actually understood the problem, solved it, and, and so on, is this notion of an anatomical compiler. Someday, you should be able to sit down in front of a computer and draw the animal or plant that you want, um, not at the level of molecular components, but the actual anatomy that you want, such as, for example, here, I want this three-headed flatworm like that. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if, if this system existed, and if we knew what we were doing, we would be, it would be able to compile your, uh, your anatomical description into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to these cells to make them build whatever you want them to build. Now, the, the, this is this this uh, is is of, of, of huge practical importance because if we were able to do this, if we were able to uh, convince a group of cells to build whatever we wanted them to build, most problems of biomedicine would go away. So birth defects, traumatic injury would be regenerated, uh, can, reprogramming cancer, um, aging, degenerative disease, all these things would go away if we understood how to communicate anatomical goals to collections of cells, and that's why. The actual solution to this kind of thing is not a 3D printer. The, the point is not to try to micromanage where the individual cells go. It's a communications device. It's a translator. It's a, um, it's a way to uh, convert your anatomical goals into the goals of the cellular collective that's going to try to build something. And I want to just say very quickly why, why it is that we don't have anything like that today. I mean, you might be wondering, I mean, we've had the decades of, of, of genetics and biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, why don't we have an anatomical compiler? Why aren't we building organs and biobots and, and so on um, to, brand, to arbitrary specifications? Well, so here's, here's an axolotl larva and uh, these guys have little, uh, their babies have little legs. Uh, frog larvae um, or tadpoles do not have legs at these stages. In our lab, we make something known as a frogolotl, which has a bunch of cells from a frog, a bunch of cells from axolotl, and you get a frogolotl. Now I can ask a simple question. We have the genomes. We have the axolotl genome. We have the frog genome. Now here's my question. Knowing those genomes, can you tell me if frogolotls are going to have legs or not? And the answer is no, you can't. And uh, th there's that question. There's the question of uh, if they do have legs, will those legs just be made of axolotl cells or will they in fact convince some frog cells to, to come along and build? What will the shape of those legs be? Uh, in fact, could we even have predicted this actual, the, the primary shape from the pure genome? No, we can't even do that. So, so there, are, there are huge areas, areas of um, uh, knowledge gap, uh, despite the understanding of the details. So where we are today in this field is this. We're, we're, we're very good at manipulating cells and molecules. In fact, all the exciting stuff in, in molecular medicine is about single molecule approaches, CRISPR, um, DN, genomic editing, that kind of thing. So, so we're very good at this. What we actually want is this. We actually want to be able to control large scale form and function. And we're a very long way away from that. And uh, I argue that the reason we're uh, far away from it is that we are still, biology is still where computer science was in the 40s and 50s. This is how we interact with life. Uh, what she's doing is um, she's reprogramming this computer by physically rewiring it. That's how you used to have to program. And of course, since then, the reason we have this 
information technology revolution is because we've realized that you don't always need to interact with things at the lowest level. Some things are reprogrammable. And uh, that means you can interact with them via inputs, stimuli, taking advantage of the native computational properties of the machine. You don't always have to rewire the hardware. Uh, bi biomedicine is, 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 still, is still here. So I think what we, uh, the next um, frontier of, uh, of, of, uh, of regenerative medicine and biology <clears throat> is to understand the native intelligence of the material that we're working with, because it's, uh, it's, it's not a simple machine. Now, when I say intelligence, what do I mean? Uh, I like William James's definition of intelligence, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. It's, um, it's, it's what I like about it. It's very cybernetic. It doesn't talk about brains or being evolved or designed or, or anything like that. It talks about what, what is, what is uh, universal and, um, and common to all examples of intelligence, which is the ability to the, a, a degree of competency to solve a particular problem in novel circumstances. So he actually had this uh, had this beautiful example of the difference between two magnets trying to get together and Romeo and Juliet trying to get together. And the reason that all of these are on the same, I mean, they sound like very different things. Of course, we're not used to thinking about them in the same way. But there's a continuum here, which is which is this: the ability to deal with barriers in your navigational space. So these two magnets are never neither of these magnets is competent to go around the barrier and get together because in order to do that, you would have to temporarily get further from your goal. And these things they are so simple, all they're doing is trying to minimize the, the, the free energy. And so, so they're never going to temporarily step away in order to get where they need to go. Uh, of course, here you have, you have huge competencies to and, and planning and all kinds of things. But in between, you have all of these other things. You have autonomous vehicles and cells and worms and, and animals that have different degrees of competency to navigate across, around barriers in their space that stand between them and their goals. And we can, we can try to quantify that in different uh, types of unconventional systems. So let's ask, okay, given this, this kind of definition, the ability to get to uh, the same goal by different means, what kind of uh, competencies do cellular swarms have? So let's look. Um, this is uh, normal development. Normal development is very robust. So you start with an egg and you end up with a, with a person, m m almost always, it's, it's, it's quite robust. However, um, what we find out is that it's actually not hardwired because if you cut this embryo into pieces and uh, you can cut them into a number of pieces, you don't get half bodies, you get perfectly normal monozygotic twins. So this system, if you de deviated from its normal starting position, it doesn't just go uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, the incorrect location, it's actually from different starting positions, it's able to navigate to that same ensemble of goal states that corresponds to a normal human organism. Uh, it has the ability to avoid local, uh, local uh, minima and so on. And so um, this is another example of this. These animals, these are axolotls, um, they regenerate their limbs. So if you cut the leg, you can cut it here, 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 anywhere. Uh, and in fact, they regenerate uh, most of their body organs. Uh, they will grow exactly what's necessary, no more, no less, until it's fixed and then they stop. So this idea of being able to get to that same location from different starting positions. So we can start here and we need to regenerate all of this, or we can start here and we only need to regenerate that. That's the ability to get to the same goal from different paths. By the way, um, these, these uh, worms and, and salamanders are not the only ones. Um, Mammals have some regenerability, so humans can regenerate their liver. Even the ancient Greeks knew that. I have no idea how they knew that. Um, deer uh, regenerate antlers. So, so every year, uh, huge amounts of bone vasculature innervation in the right pattern. Uh, the bone grows at a rate of a centimeter per day. Um, so, so really incredible uh, rates of bone growth. And then even human children can regenerate their fingertips. So below a certain age, if you lose a fingertip and you just sort of keep it clean and not uh, try to uh, sew the skin, uh, you will actually regenerate your fingertips. So um, here's, here's one of my uh, maybe all time uh, favorite examples of, uh, of, of morphogenetic problem solving. This is what you're looking at here is a cross section through a kidney tubule and it has a space in the middle. And normally what happens is that eight or nine of these uh, little cells get together and they work together and they build this tubule. But what you can do is you can make newts with extra genetic material. And the first amazing thing is that you still get a normal newt, even though you have multiple copies of the chromosomes. So that's <laughs> already amazing. But what happens is the cells get bigger to accommodate uh, the extra copies of the genomes. And as the cells get bigger, it turns out that fewer and fewer of them will work together to make exactly the same size lumen. So that's amazing thing number two, they scale their um, uh, collective uh, behavior to the size of the, of the cells. 
But here's the most amazing part. If you make the cells truly gigantic, and I believe this is either six or eight times the normal DNA that they should have, uh, these gigantic cells will now just wrap around themselves, not work with anybody else, but wrap around themselves and produce and leave a hole in the middle that's the same, the same lumen. So now here's why this is incredible. It's because this is a completely different mechanism than this. This is cell to cell communication and standard tubulogenesis. This is cytoskeletal bending. And what you're seeing here is a kind of top-down causation. It's the ability of the system to call up different molecular mechanisms to achieve the same um, uh, large-scale anatomical goal. The, the getting to, so this is, the, remember uh, James's definition now, the ability to get to the same outcome, the same region of anatomical morphous space by different means, by using different tools in your toolkit to uh, get this accomplished. Now, uh, just think about what this means for, uh, for, for biology. If you're a salamander uh, coming into this world, it means that you can't rely on, you, 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 you don't know uh, how, how many copies of your, of your genetic material you're going to have. You can't rely on the size or the number of your cells. You don't know any of that. You have to figure out all of these things from scratch. And you have to be able to make a proper salamander of the exact same size, even if you can't rely on your own parts. Not only weird perturbations from outside, like somebody cuts an embryo in half or some sort of damage. This is much more fundamental. You, you, even your parts are unreliable and you still have to, uh, you still have to be able to get the job done. So um, there, are, there are huge uh, evolutionary implications of this, which I don't have really time to go into now, except to say that the, this kind of plasticity, the, 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 the fact that uh, evolution gives rise to problem solving machines, not specific uh, solutions to specific problems, um, has major implications for evolution itself. So there's this, there's this constant uh, feedback loop between the intelligence that is, that's evolved, that, that's due to evolved mechanisms and the feedback on the evolutionary process of the fact that your parts can make up for problems. The fact that even damage, various kinds of damage, you still get a workable um, animal. And this results in a really interesting uh, intelligence ratchet that we can talk about where the pressure ends up, uh, the evolutionary pressure ends up um, uh, ramping up this competency mechanism at the expense of structural genomes. So, um, in order to, to, to get into this, uh, to this notion of bioelectricity, I just want to look at one simple uh, uh, example of, of this, kind of, uh, this kind of navigational competency, which is the frog face. So these tadpoles, this is a, this is a tadpole of Xenopus labus. They have to become this adult. In order to do that, they have to rearrange their face. Their eyes have to move, their jaws have to move, the nostrils, the whole face has to be rearranged. And it used to be thought that this was a hardwired process that basically... Um, uh, Every organ just moved the right distance in the right direction, and then you get your normal frog. We decided to test that process and ask how much intelligence there is. So you see, this is a, this is the, these are all experimental kinds of questions. You cannot just assume these things. So what we did was, uh, much like uh, James's definition, we 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 changed the. Uh, that we, we, we changed the starting position. So we made a scrambled, we call these Picasso tadpoles. We scrambled the face. So the eyes off to the side of the head, the jaws are on top of the head. Everything is, everything is mixed up. And what we found is that these animals make largely quite normal frogs. All of this stuff moves in abnormal paths and abnormal configurations to get to the same, uh, the same uh, final goal. In fact, sometimes they go too far and they actually have to double back. They have to come back a little bit. So you see this, this is this, this system, uh, what evolution gives you uh, here is not uh, a set of movements for tissue. It gives you an error minimization scheme. It gives you the ability to minimize error from different starting positions to get to a particular state. So that raises a, a, a very obvious question. How does it know what the correct state is? And so what we've been doing is to this standard uh, picture of, uh, of, of developmental biology, uh, where you have uh, some, some gene regulatory networks and then some, 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 um, some physics happens with these proteins. And then there's emergence, this, this magical process whereby you get this complex shape. Yeah, it's not all feed forward. There's this, there's this amazing ability, both at the level of physics and genetics, to uh, return you to a correct state if you're deviated by injury, mutation, teratogens, whatever. And so... Um, if, if so, so this is this is a model of a kind of uh, anatomical homeostasis, and so in these kinds of models, uh, what's what's very key is that like with a thermostat in your house, any kind of homeostatic process has to have a set point. There has to be a uh, an explicit representation of what the goal is, so that you can calculate error. How far off are we at any given moment? So this is what this has been our research program for years now is to test this hypothesis by looking for that set point, learning to 
uh, re rewrite it, to, to read it and rewrite it. And the idea is that you don't have to make all your uh, interventions down here at the, at the genetic level. You can actually rewrite the set point and let the system do what it does best, which is to solve to that, uh, to that uh, set point. So, so what, what could possibly be a mechanism that stores a set point as complex as, a, as, a, as an anatomical descriptor, as a, as a layout? And uh, we looked at the brain uh, as, as a kind of uh, inspiration in the brain, the way, the way goals and navigation works in the brain is using this system. So you've got ion channels in, uh, in neurons. Uh, they let uh, ion, individual ions go in and out that creates a bioelectrical state, which may or may not be propagated through these electrical synapses known as gap junctions to their neighbors. And the ability to control how signaling flows through this network is a computational, a very basic computational medium that gives rise to this kind of software that here you can see the physiology of a, of a zebrafish brain as the zebrafish thinks about whatever it is that zebrafish think about. And uh, and it's the commitment of neuroscience that all of the memories, the, the preferences, the, uh, the goals, the competencies of, of, of these uh, creatures are encoded in that electrophysiology of the brain. And there's this notion of neural decoding. If we understood how to read it, we could read memories out of, out of the brain. Um, it turns out that this is an ancient, this, this kind of system is evolutionarily ancient. It goes back to uh, bacterial biofilms. Every cell in your body has ion channels. Most cells have these electrical connections. And we can do the same kind of decoding, this kind of non-neural decoding, by looking at electrical activity. This, uh, this happens to be an early frog embryo. Um, we're visualizing the electrical patterns. And again, try to decode where is it trying to get to an anatomical morphous space, whereas um, what you're seeing is, 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 a, is a clear isomorphism between neuroscience and developmental biology, where typically the electrical activity of this network tells your muscles what to do. It controls your muscles to move you through three-dimensional space. The rest of the body, would, long before that, uh, the rest of the body was using the exact same thing. Electrical networks using the same components to move the configuration of your body through morphous space. Same trick, different space. Um, and so, and so we developed the first molecular tools to read and write these things. So, so here's uh, our use of voltage sensitive dyes to uh, control the, uh, the bioelectric patterns within embryos to, to, to read out what all the electric communications are. Uh, of course, we do a lot of computational modeling and simulation to understand how they connect to the channels and pumps that produce them. Here is uh, are just an example of two patterns. This is a, a, a time-lapse movie of voltage patterns as a, bio, as an, a frog embryo is, is, a, is originally putting its face together here. And you can see one frame out of this movie. I'm showing this to you because this is one of the easiest patterns to recognize. This, this pattern memory, is it literally looks like a face. You can see where the animal's eye is going to be, where the placodes, the mouth. You can see where everything's going to be. And I'm going to show you in a minute what happens when you uh, perturb this uh, this representation of what a correct frog face is. So this is a normal, this is an endogenous normal pattern. This is what controls the downstream gene expression and anatomy of the face. Uh, if you if you mess with this, uh, then all of those downstream steps go 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 awry. And this this in contrast is a pathological pattern. This is a human oncogene. And you can see that these cells, first thing that happens when you express an oncogene, the cells electrically disconnect from their neighbors. And they're basically, they're starting, they're, they're gonna treat the rest of the tissue as external environment. They're no longer connected. They're just uh, unicellular uh, life forms at this point. So um, beyond uh, reading these, uh, the, the, uh, the kind of um, basically reading the mind of this, of this morphological collective intelligence of cells, we have the ability now to write information into that as well. Um, as people like Tanagawa do in the brain when they in, incept false memories into, into mice. So what we can do is we can take all of the tools from uh, neuroscience. And so this is very important. The tools of neuroscience really don't distinguish between neural and non-neural cells. They all work, all the same, all the same con the concepts, uh, the, the, the laboratory techniques, the, well, the neurotransmitter machinery, like everything works. And so what we can do is we can control the gap junctions, which cells talk to which other cells, and we can control the actual electrical states by opening and closing these ion channels. So remember, there are no, there, there are no magnets here. There are no fields, no waves, no radiations, no electrodes. We are using the native interface that cells use to program each other. There's this electrical interface on their surface that controls the information processing. And this is how cells hack each other's behavior during normal development. Um, and also, by the way, how some parasites uh, hack their hosts. But, uh, but we, are, we are just exploiting that same interface. The reason all of this works is not because we're, we're so clever. It's because the cells have a beautiful um, uh, high efficiency interface that, that they offer to us. 
So when you do this, uh, let's, so, so what can you do this way? What, what kind of false memories can you Im imprint onto a collective agent? And just, let's just uh, take stock of what we've said so far. Groups of cells are a collective intelligence which navigates anatomical space to solve various problems and reach the correct region. So what happens when we uh, incept false memories into this collective agent that is storing and processing those memories in an electrical network? Well, one thing you can easily do is, is, uh, is inject a particular ion channel RNA to trigger a voltage state that corresponds to that I spot that I just showed you in that electric face model. And when you do that, let's say we do that to a bunch of cells that are going to become gut, uh, those cells become convinced to make an eye. And so here's a tadpole, uh, here's, the, here's the gut, here's the eye sitting on their gut. Um, you can make eyes anywhere, in fact. So this, and, and these eyes, if you section them, they have all the right lens, right? And the optic nerve, all that stuff. So, so there's a couple of things you learn from this. One is that the bioelectric pattern is instructive. It's not just about making errors or, or causing monsters. It's about telling the cells you should build an eye and they actually build a complete complex structure. Number two, this is hugely modular. We have no idea how to micromanage the formation of an eye. It's very complex. What we do know is how to uh, put in a memory that's basically a, um, it's a, it's a subroutine call or a trigger that says build an eye here. All the competency is in the rest of the cells. We just found uh, the, the language by which they encode which uh, structure should be built, right? And downstream of that is all of the correct gene expression, all this, the size control, all of that stuff is downstream. There's also, uh, there's also another really cool aspect to this, which is, which is this. this. This here is a cross section of a lens uh, sitting in the tail of a, of a tadpole somewhere. And the blue cells are the ones that we actually injected with our ion channel. So the blue cells have had their voltage modified. All of these other cells are completely natural cells, but they all participate in this lens formation. Why? Because these cells can, can ascertain that there's not enough of them to build a whole lens. And so they recruit their neighbors. And so much like other collective intelligences like ants and termites, which recruit their buddies when, when something needs to be done and the, the, you know, there needs to be more of them, this collective intelligence scales to the task at hand. Again, natively, we, we didn't have to um, uh, uh, teach them how to implement this or, or try to micromanage it in any way. And in fact, uh, there's actually a really interesting... Um, uh, battle going on here because what you can do is you can make uh, any number of uh, these these blue these blues um, this is also frog embryo and these blue spots are other areas where we've injected our potassium channel and what they what they're doing is they're expressing i i precursor markers but in the end they might only make one eye not the three that you might expect from looking at this it's because the cells are are are, are fighting it out the, the 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 injected cells are saying to their neighbors hey let's all let's all make an eye there should be an eye here and you guys need to help the surrounding skin cells are saying uh, no, you should be skinned. There doesn't need to be an eye here. You should be skinned. And depending on how that conversation uh, goes, you might make one, two, well, zero, one, two, or more eyes. So this is a, this is a very much a collective intelligence kind of problem where they're actually uh, communicating with each other to decide what's what's going to happen. And so you can make other other interesting things. You can make um, fins and you can make ectopic hearts. I mean, fins are kind of wild because tadpoles aren't supposed to have fins. That's more of a fish thing, um, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, you can make ectopic hearts, you can make ectopic legs, uh, ectopic forebrain. So you can convince the very, very readily convince these cells to build new kinds of structures. Why? Because without micromanaging all the gene expression, we're not talking to stem cells. It's very modular. It's because that is how the collective is processing information about what to build and where to build it. And that means that we can do regenerative uh, medicine applications like this, where we take this, uh, this the frogs, unlike salamanders normally don't regenerate their legs. And so uh, you, can, you can amputate here and um, uh, normally nothing, nothing happens by 45 days later, but we, can, we make a bioelectric uh, a cocktail that we apply here that uh, tells the cells rebuild the leg and immediately uh, within a couple of days, they have a pro-regenerative blastema. And then by 45 days, they've got some toes, they've got a toenail and the leg is eventually touch sensitive and motile. So the whole thing is, uh, becomes a pretty, pretty respectable leg after that. So the idea is that a very uh, low content input, very simple trigger gives a very high information content result, not because we know how to, how to make a leg. We have no idea how to, how to make a frog leg, but because the system is already competent to do this and needs to be convinced to do so. Uh, this is where I have to do a disclosure because uh, Dave Kaplan and I are co-founders of a company called Morphoceuticals. And we are working to take some of that technology now into mammals, um, eventually, hopefully into um, humans. 
Okay, the second model system uh, that uh, that I want to show you is is to come back to these planaria. These planaria are uh, a fascinating system. They are so highly regenerative. In fact, they're immortal. Um, so they regenerate everything, and they just sort of live um, live forever. And so one might ask this this very important question: uh, If you cut them in half, the bottom end uh, because uh, grows a tail, the top end grows a head. But these cells that you just separated were next door neighbors before you cut them. How come they have completely different anatomical fates? That question cannot be answered locally. You can't tell from where you are what you should build. You have to communicate with the rest of the body and figure out what's missing. So this is non-local uh, decision making. So we ask this question when you amputate um, this, this planarian, how do you know um, uh, how many heads you're supposed to have? And it turns out that there's an electrical gradient uh, that we characterize that tells you how many heads you're supposed to have. And if you and, and what you can do is uh, you cut off the head and the tail, and this middle fragment will regrow a nice, perfect worm 100% of the time. But because we understood this, this gradient, we were actually able to make these two-headed worms by taking this electrical, so here it says one head, but now we can make, we can say, no, actually, you should have two heads. And sure enough, this isn't Photoshop. These are real animals. Um, they, uh, they make nice uh, two-headed forms. Now, here's the really important part. This bioelectric map is not a map of this two-headed creature. This bioelectric map is a map of this one-headed creature. So what we did was we rewrote the bioelectrical, uh, the stable bioelectrical pattern memory in this one-headed animal, and it stays one-headed with a normal gene expression. So here, anterior genes only in the head, only in the head, not in the tail, and it's until you injure the animal. Uh, the same body, the same one-headed body can store two different representations. So at the very beginning, I told you that this collective intelligence works towards, it's a, it's a homeostatic loop that's happening now. It's a representation of what you're going to do in this. This is a very simple way of doing that, that I think uh, uh, brains uh, kind of appropriated this trick. Now, why do I keep calling it a memory? Because if you uh, if you cut the, 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 if you take these two-headed animals and you, it doesn't do that once once you've convinced these cells that a planarian should have two heads, it will do that uh, in perpetuity uh, no matter how many times you cut. We actually have a way of setting it back to one head by again by targeting this this bioelectric circuit. We can sort of flip them back and forth. Here you can see what these uh, two-headed guys are doing. Uh, this is this is memory. It has it's long-term stable. It's uh, rewritable, it has conditional recall, as I just showed you, or latency, and it has discrete behaviors. So, so what we're doing is we're reading and writing patterns into the collective intelligence of these cells that must navigate um, uh, computational neuroscience to understand how electrical networks can store patterns, uh, do pattern completion, and, and, and uh, navigate spaces intelligently. It's actually not just about head number, it's also about head the amorphous space. We talked about this anatomical belonging to other species of planaria, which they naturally go to, but this hardware is uh, perfectly willing to go to these attractors if, uh, if correctly prompted. Um, uh, it's just not what they normally do, but but you can prompt them. So so there's real this this again this 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 notion of navigating that space using the electrical connections between cells to store uh, the policies of where are you going, and we have the ability to to control that. Not only of course. Uh, in the standard, uh, this morphous space of standard planary and shapes, but you can make some really weird looking things. You can make these spiky forms, you can make these three dimensional um, things that look like a little hat, a little ski cap, or, or these kind of hybrid forms. Um, and the latent morphous space, which, which are, uh, Darcy Thompson already uh, in 1917 already foresaw, uh, the, the, different, uh, the different kinds of uh, possibilities for this same genetically wild type hardware is immense. And so now what we want to understand is all of, we, we, we want to build a full stack model where, where that goes from the genetics of which ion channels are present. And so that's the genome that sets your hardware to the software that's implemented by the tissue wide electrical dynamics that we can simulate using our various simulators, all the way to large scale representations that eventually uh, get cached out as basically algorithms uh, or navigation policies that make it much easier to control the system than if you try to do it bottom up this way. So. Um, uh, so, 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 uh, for, for kind of, and I didn't show you some of our biomedical, um, uh, kinds of, uh, stories, but, but the idea is that what we want to do is complement the traditional, <clears throat> uh, bottom-up approaches that are all focused on the hardware with ways to, uh, with, with top-down strategies that seek to take advantage of the software. And this has to do with, uh, li literally behaviorally training cells and tissues, including the, and really understanding the decision-making of the material 
to have much more efficient control. And for this reason, I've, I've argued that uh, future medicine is going to look a lot more like a kind of um, somatic psychiatry than it's going to look like chemistry, because it's not about changing the physical landscape. It's about changing the, the tissue agent's perception of that landscape. And you can see more, more details on all this stuff is, uh, is, in these, is in these papers. Okay. So, um, uh, for the last, uh, and I think I'm, I'm running somewhat behind, so I'm going to uh, kind of go go quickly here. But uh, uh, the last uh, section, I just want to show you uh, a few um, a few new things uh, related to this uh, to this uh, to this framework. So so the interesting thing about uh, uh, tr trying to um, put all of these uh, d very diverse uh, agents, for example, a collective tissues uh, navigating morphospace space um, together uh, with conventional agents on the uh, on the same scale is that you can you can come up with a with a central invariant which uh, which I have picked as the spatiotemporal size of the largest goal you can pursue. So so all agents have in common one fundamental thing, which is that they pursue goals. And so now the question is, are you only interested in the local sugar concentration and you have a memory of a couple of minutes back and a predictive capacity of a couple of minutes forward, and then you might be a bacterium? Or do you have a bigger cognitive light cone and you might have a memory going backwards and uh, 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 some predictive capacity going forwards, but you're never going to care about what happens in three months, two towns over. So you might be a dog if that's the case. Or you might be a human, which has a huge huge cognitive light cone and you're you're actively working towards world peace and the, what the financial markets are going to do 100 years from now you could have a huge cognitive light cone so this idea of and we of course are, are a compound intelligence where our cells have, have uh, little tiny light cones and our organs do and so do we and and possibly uh, larger structures in which we participate so this idea of a cognitive light cone is based around the goals that any particular system can follow and so that allows you to start thinking about what an individual actually is what are cells given that we're all collective intelligences we're made of parts we're you know basically a bunch of cells in a, in a trench coat how does the um how does the collectivity and the unification happen um well, let's look at the very early steps of, uh, of, of embryogenesis. Uh, this is an embryonic blastoderm. There might be 50,000 cells. Uh, there's one embryo. What do we mean by one embryo? What are we counting? What is there one of? Well, what there's one of is alignment, not just physical alignment, although that's true too. Cells have to physically align with each other in planar polarity, but we are counting alignment of purpose. What we're saying is that under normal circumstances, all of these cells will work together to build exactly this thing. They all, th this whole blastoderm, all of them together have this one goal. And we know that because if we try to deviate, they will try to compensate. They are all together trying to get to this one goal. We're counting, uh, we're counting um, goals and alignment and they have a particular size of, of this goal state that they're trying to fit. Uh, it's actually quite interesting to ask how many selves are in here. It's the same question with brains. If you didn't all brain and said, uh, in this volume of substrate, how many selves can fit there? And we actually really have, you, you would have no idea what, what the density of selves per unit material is because, and so, so the question of how many embryos are of autopoiesis or self-construction world, uh, and, uh, and, and that, you, you, the, the, this, this kind of, um, uh, uh, generative zero, one, two, up to, you know, probably a half a dozen or so different selves. And the same thing is true uh, in the brain, actually. Um, and I think this goes back to that point about Turing is we also individuals, but we know from, from studies of split brain patients and dissociative identity disorders that there's actually not clearly just one self inside the medium of our, of our ner nervous uh, system. And organs have to decide this too. Instead of making one giant eye, this one's decided to make three slightly smaller ones. Uh, ways to 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 uh, scale up our goals so from the goals of individual cells to um uh, uh being able to from 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 pursuing little tiny goals like metabolic states and and and, and proliferation and things like that to to work on these very large construction projects where no individual cell knows how many fingers you're supposed to have but the collective does because every time you amputate one it'll grow exactly the right number but that that has a has a failure mode and that failure mode is um uh, is cancer. So in cancer, this is human glioblastoma. These cells have electrically disconnected. And as far as they're concerned, the rest of the body is just uh, environment to them. And so that idea, that, that shifting boundary of the self, the shifting scale of the goals you care about from local single cell goals to large anatomical goals to once you're a neural human system, you know, much bigger goals than that, is, uh, is a way to uh, start addressing some, some biomedical problems. For example, cancer. What we've done here is... Um, We've uh, induced a, uh, a human onc is the same animal. There's no tumor because what because the the hardware is not what drives. It's not the genetics that drives. It's the physio and our in. So I'm going to skip all the um 
Uh, the Zenobot stuff, we can we can come back to it if people have uh, questions about it. And uh, just to uh, just to point out a couple of quick a couple of quick and simple things, um, uh, we, we the basic development is uh, is so um, reliable that we get uh, we get lured into a false sense of. Uh, um, a robustness, which is that, you know, we know that oaks make oak trees and we think, well, here's what the, uh, the oak um, genome can do. This, this acorn is going to make things like this, a nice flat green structure. But what we don't realize, and we don't know this until some parasite like, um, like a wasp prompts the cells with chemical signals with something completely different. That morphous space, that latent space of possibilities, that behavioral space is unknown to us until we start to experiment by probing it with very collective wants them to do so that kind of um, we can now uh, we can now uh, say that that uh, synthetic um, constructs like like these xenobots that we have made uh, are a tool together with the xenobot is actually it's not this little tiny thing that we make it's actually this whole structure including the environment um, uh, including high agency aspects of the environment, like we, the bioengineers, and lower agency uh, aspects of the environment, like chemical signals and so on, is a way to look into the various spaces that a collective might be traversing. And these might be uh, behavioral, physiological, transcriptional, and, and many others that we may not know. So um, I'm just going to uh, summarize my points here, which is to say that uh, in this, in this framework, we look at a continuum of agency. Um, we, I, I don't like binary categories. I think they're completely artificial. Um, I think these questions are empirical. Uh, they are not uh, philosophical. We have to do the experiments and see which substrates have what capacities. We can define selves as a boundary of goals that the collective system is capable of pursuing, but it's on us as observers to recognize those goals in an optimal way. And we're not very good at it. Uh, of course, interacts with this whole process, but in a bi-directional way. And so the last thing I wanna point out is simply this, that uh, when Darwin looked at the uh, richness of variety in the biological world, he boards uh, hybrids and cyborgs and hybrids and, and chimeras of various kinds. M many of these already exist and many more are going to exist because all of this is possible because life is, is all of this is possible because life is so interoperable. And the reason it's so interoperable is that uh, evolution makes from scratch every single time. And, and thus novelty is not surprising to them. They're dealing with a uh, with a with a with a very unreliable medium, they they basically the whole architecture assumes that things are going to be broken, things are not going to work the way you expect, and you have to solve problems from scratch. And for this reason, all of these things are viable, and that means that um, going forward in the next uh, couple of decades, we are going to be surrounded by creatures that are nowhere on the tree of life with us. We cannot use the old familiar uh, strategies of asking where on the tree of life is it? Is it more like a snake or a dog or a dolphin? Or a, a, w w these things are gonna be nowhere on that, um, on that scale. And the old uh, categories of is it, is it, is it uh, engineered versus natural? Is it a machine versus an organism? All of these crisp categories are gonna become completely useless. I mean, they were, they were never correct, but at least in the olden days, they were a rough ethics for relating to minds that are that are uh, that are not like ours, and that's really critical. So I'm going to stop here. If uh, anybody's interested in these kind of things, you can um, hear some uh, some papers that are all on my website. I want to thank the uh, uh, the postdocs and the students who did all this work. Um, lots of lots of people that contributed to the stuff I showed you today. Um, all of our collaborators, all of our funders. Uh, and uh, most importantly, uh, the model systems, the animal model systems, because they do all the heavy lifting. So I will stop here and ask uh, questions. All right, Michael, that was uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so we are doing a virtual round of applause. I have a ton of questions. I mean, I, I, I saw a similar talk uh, in, in the conference last year, and uh, feel free to uh, raise your hands here virtually and, and in, the, in the reaction stuff. So if you want to ask a question, just please uh, raise your hand. Um, here virtually in the Zoom, and um, I'll, I'll basically moderate in this in this session. Okay, I think uh, Bastian, yeah, you, you have a few questions in the in the Discord as well, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, that is a very fascinating fascinating talk. Um, uh, yeah, my first question is um, where. Is the bioelectrical set point for the white types where I'm storing uh, I'm storing these patterns? I mean, on the one hand, I, I showed them to you. You can literally see them. So we now using our voltage dyes, you can actually see these patterns. So so where they're stored is the same place that uh, let's say where where our computer memory is stored. They're stored as 
patterns of electrical activity in RAM. So you, you can see in the tissue, there's an electric circuit and you can see the voltage patterns distributed across that circuit. And the, the layout of those patterns specify heads, eyes, uh, you know, legs and, and so on. So, so on the proximal level, we, we know where they're stored. They're stored in the stable resting potential distributions across tissue. So, so at the proximal level, we, we see where they are. Uh, there's a deeper way to ask that question is, which, which is 